Okay, this morning we shall continue where we left off yesterday. Yesterday, now last night, last evening session, I uh, taken us to a very broad uh, understanding or a very broad framework on how we can understand and read Revelation. I painted to you uh, the context out of which the book of Revelation was written uh, by John the Apostle as he was exiled in the island of Patmos. We have looked at some of the historical background, the context of how Christians who have lived during that time towards the end of the first century, which is the period where many believe the book of Revelation uh, would have been written. We have looked at uh, some of the literary genre that the book of Revelation or the style of the literature that the, Revelation, the book of Revelation was uh, written for us. And we have also briefly considered some of the various interpretive approaches uh, in reading the book of Revelation. And so that we understand that why is it you ask, um, you ask people about the book of Revelation, every one of them, almost every one of them have their own interpretation, have their own understanding, have their own uh, uh, insight into, into the book of Revelation. As I mentioned yesterday, what I try to do is I try not to impose any of the interpretive framework in that sense. I'm not going to say this is a printerist approach, this is a historical approach, uh, as I mentioned yesterday. But what I like to do is we'll read portions of Revelation together and we allow the scripture to speak to us. We allow the timeless truth of the word of God to speak to us. And what is that fundamental underlying message of Revelation for all of us. So that was the approach that I was trying to take. And so with that approach, I believe whether you are a pre you believe in pre-millennium, your A millennium, your uh, whatever millennium that you are in position you take, you will see that the scripture still remains true. There are plenty, there are a lot of truth that we can glean from God's word. And I also suggested yesterday that if you flip through the pages of Revelation, you will find that there's a lot of worship material in the book of Revelation. Many times it was repeated that uh, the 24 elders, so they fall down and they worship God. There are people from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, they offer songs of praise to God. So Revelation is full of worship. And I suggested yesterday that when we read Revelation, perhaps we have to see why there's so much hymnic material uh, in Revelation, and a lot of words from Revelation actually inspired many songs, many hymns that we sing uh, today. So I suggested yesterday, perhaps we need to consider Revelation carefully that this is a liturgical text for us. It's like a worship book for us to encourage us, to exhort us to worship God. Because if we worship God, we will not worship any other gods that are surrounding us. And that was a challenge of the people who live uh, in the first century. So that's what we have covered yesterday. So I'm not sure whether any brave soul before you sleep last night, you pick up the book of Revelation and you read a few chapters. If you have not done so, it's okay. We'll go through some portions of it. Uh, so what I'm going to do this morning is we're going to uh, take a little bit more time to look at chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation, which is essentially the message of Christ to the seven churches located in Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey today. Uh, why do I want to spend a bit more time on these seven letters? This is because this is very important because Revelation was originally written to these seven churches. It was a message for these seven churches. So I would like to start by looking at God's message uh, to the seven churches. And we're going to reflect together how these seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation would have made sense to them and it would still make sense uh, for us uh, today. So we'll spend the bulk of the morning session, uh, probably the first, maybe one and a half session on uh, uh, these two chapters, and then we'll move on to chapter 4 and 5, we'll sing a couple of hymns, and then we'll move on to the rest of uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, as I said yesterday as well, uh, when we move to the second half of Revelation, when we talk about the series of seven seals, 
the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. Uh, I suggested that if you look at how ancient authors write, they often don't write in a linear chronological fashion. They will write in a fashion where they will say one thing, but they will repeat it a number of times to make a point. And I highlighted one good example is the first page in the Bible. You see that in Genesis chapter 1, there is a creation account. And you move to Genesis chapter 2, there's also another creation account. So ancient author likes to repeat the same thing from different angles. You go through one cycle, and then you pick another cycle, and you do another cycle. And you see things from different perspectives, but they are talking about the same thing and so that's how they'll do it and perhaps later in the afternoon or maybe before we start to look at the series of seven the seven seals the seven trumpet and the seven uh, bowls i will probably give you a modern day uh, apocalyptic literature it's how it sounds like hopefully that will give you an idea <laughs> okay let's turn to revelation uh, uh, chapter two or oh, maybe look at chapter one first Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. I've read it already, but just want to read it again. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, a faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the king of the earth. So with this opening words, uh, John, this, uh, John described for us the, the recipients of this book of Revelation. They are the seven churches that are located in the region of Asia. And as I said yesterday, uh, these seven churches, uh, the sequence that the letter was being mentioned in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 is according to the sequence that, a, let's say you're a courier person in those days, this is the sequence that you would deliver the letter. You land at the port in Ephesus, and then you travel up north to Sumna, and you deliver the second letter, and then you move on up north to Bergamon, and you, you deliver the third letter, and then you turn uh, eastwards, and then you deliver the next letter to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And that is why we find that sequence of the seven uh, churches. Now, I also mentioned yesterday that when we think about the seven churches, there are, perhaps there are uh, various ways that people have interpreted this uh, letters to seven churches. And one, one of the approach is to suggest that each of this letter uh, describes a particular era throughout the church history. For example, the church in Ephesus described the apostolic church, the Sumna, the persecuted church, the government is a compromised church that we see after Constantine declared Christianity as the official religion of the empire. And then Thyatira talk about the medieval church, Sardis is the Reformation churches, Philadelphia is a true church that you find in the 18th to the 20th century, and Laodicea is a church I represent today. And this is a very common interpretive approach that you will see in uh, some literature. But I would like to suggest that perhaps this is not what John the Revelation meant it to be. Let us read these seven letters in light of its original context, and I think that is the message of Revelation to these churches. So it's not about this seven period of history. So before we start, let us read Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Okay, if you look at your hand now, in page 3 and page 4, I listed for you a chart. Now what I'd like you to do, if you have not got a chance to read uh, these seven letters in a bit more uh, depth, this is a good time for us to do so. Probably for the next 15 minutes or so, let us read uh, these two chapters of Revelation. And what I would like us to do is, you see the chart, right? And when you read uh, the letters to the seven churches, we, you will probably immediately notice that there is a certain pattern that they follow throughout. Right? John followed throughout. There is a pattern where there was addressed to the seven churches, each of the seven churches. There is an identification of speaker who is Christ and speaking to them. And then he often followed by commendation, how the church, a particular church is being praised, a particular church is being criticized, and then you will see that maybe there's one or two churches that may not have criticism and commendation, and then there is a call for the church to hear 
and the promise for those who are faithful, right? So if you go back to the chart, you can see, like I list down the church, Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. What are the commendations that you can find here? Some may not have commendation, but most of them would have. What are the commendations? What did Christ commend the church for? And then what is the rebuke for them? What, what, what have they done wrong or what have they compromised that God is rebuking them? And as you read it, what is the exaltation of Christ for them? And what is the promise of the reward for them if they do what is right? right? So I'd like you to take this time, probably the next 10-15 minutes or so, just read through Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Just fill up um, the, the chart that you can find in the three pages of your uh, handout. And we will go through uh, each of these seven churches uh, after this. So take some time. If you like to do it together with your neighbors in a small group, just feel free to turn around and share some of your insight. Just feel free to do so. But just take this next uh, 10 15 minutes just to read through these two chapters and fill up the chart. And then when I go through that, then you, 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 you can follow along with me. Okay, let's do that. pattern right there is uh, there is the address to the church there is a praise or commendation to, to most of the churches they will rebuild for most of the churches and there is always uh, an exhortation a challenge given to the church in order to do what is right and then there is always a promise that God gives to the church now when you look at these seven churches you'll probably find that that Semna and Philadelphia are the two churches that has no rebuke. Right? There's no rebuke. Uh, there's only praises for them and exhortation for them. There's no rebuke. And you also notice that the church in Sardis and in Laodicea, there's no commendation for them. Straight away the rebuke. Right? So this is quite, quite interesting. Now, when there is a general pattern when we read the Bible, right? When there, there is a series of narratives or series of similar pattern or series of events, and we often want to look for what, what is the general pattern, what is something that is out of the ordinary. So like in this case, you'll find that, interestingly, for Sunna and Philadelphia, there is no rebuke for them. Why is it there's no rebuke for them? Why is it that these two churches are so special? And then when you look at Sardis and Laodicea, there's no commendation for them. Straight away, they were being rebuked. Why is this so? And so when, if we have this question in our minds, then when we look at the seven letters in greater depth, we'll probably find some answers in there. Right? So you all have got a feel of all the letters, the seven churches really, right? So let's move to look at the first church, that is uh, the church in Ephesus. Let me read. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil. But you have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'm going to, I will come to remove to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet you, this you have. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has had ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is the paradise of God. So if you look at this, you see verse 2 and verse 3, these are the commendations. The church in Ephesus, um, they have great works, they have great patience, they are deeply rooted in the truth of the gospel, they are not easily uh, persuaded by false teachers, those are great. And yet there is, a, there is a rebuke for them in verse 4, I this against you that you abandon the love you have at first. 
And then there is an exhortation. Remember where you have fallen, repent and do the works. Right? And then there is a reward that's given to them. If you, you have an ear and you hear what the Spirit is saying to you, to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. So you see, there is a commendation, there is a rebuke, there is an exhortation, there is a promise that was given to them. So this is the, uh, the general pattern that we see uh, when we read the seven letters. Let's look at it in some depth right now. Interestingly, this is a church that was being praised because they resisted false teachers and false prophets. False teachers and false prophets have no place in Ephesus. So in other words, this is a church that is deeply rooted in the teaching of God's truth. This is a church who knows its foundation. So when you come and preach heresy in this church in Ephesus, they tell you, this is heretic, you have no place in this place. So you want to talk about defender of the truth? This is a fantastic church. You might want to say, this church probably has the best theological seminaries. This is a church that has the best teachers. This church has the best preachers. Probably has the best Sunday school, the best Christian education program, the best adult learning program, so that everyone is educated, everyone is deeply rooted in their faith. And not only that, they know the scripture well. They know the truth of the gospel. They hold on dearly to the death and the resurrection of Jesus. This is the church in Ephesus. Now, in the second century, early second century, uh, one of the early church father, Ignatius, who is the bishop of Antioch. Uh, bishop and Antioch is located in the um, towards the western part of Turkey, near the Syrian border. And uh, this is uh, the, the place where the Christians were for, the, the people who the followers of Christ were first called Christians. And this was actually a Gentile headquarters that sent Paul and Barnabas off their mission journey. So this is the place Paul made his base and Paul travels for all his three mission journeys from Antioch. So Bishop of Antioch Ignatius, he wrote a letter to, uh, to this church in Ephesus and he praised the church for being a church that is well taught in the gospel that no other orthodox group can gain a hearing among the members. That is something very commendable. Now, I often wonder whether is this the result of Paul's extended stay in Ephesus? Now, if you follow Paul's mission journey, when you were here last month when we did the Book of Acts, uh, I left out Paul's visit to the Ephesus because uh, I said that I'll be back here and doing Revelation, so I'm going to spend a bit more time on Paul's visit to the Ephesus. This Ephesus is the place where Paul spent the longest period of time in his missionary journey. He spent more than two years here in Ephesus. The second place he spent the longest time is actually in Corinth, a year and a half. So this is the place where during Paul's third missionary journey, he spent two years plus preaching the gospel. And Ephesus is a great city. It's one of the largest metropolitan during the time of Paul. And this is just a schematic uh, drawing of Ephesus because it's an important seaport. So this is the seaport and from there you can see that there is a stadium here, there is a theatre here, there are temples everywhere. And you know the city is a thriving city just by looking at their agora. Agora means it's like a market square, a market square where people carry out their daily trade activities. Uh, in other words, it's like our shopping malls today. So you have a large agora here, a large temple here, another large agora here, another agora here, and then shops along the way. It gives an idea that this is a city that is very wealthy. A lot of trade, a lot of business uh, takes place here. And, and then Ephesus is also famous for its library. Um, there are three major libraries in the ancient world. The largest is found in Alexandria in Egypt. One is in Ephesus and the other is in Pergamon, which we're going to visit uh, later on. And, and this is a hill, so this is a more flat land here. And of course the theatre was built along the hill slope. 
Now, over the other side of the hill here is another major temple. That is the temple of Artemis, Diana. And this temple of Artemis is known as one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. So you can imagine Ephesus has its attraction. It has its temple to attract the crowd. It is a, a very major seaport. It's a business center. It's a port center. It's a port market. It is a, uh, it's a, uh, a port city. And many people congregate here. And it has one of the largest uh, theater. The theater during the times of Paul can sit about 20,000 people. And then after the times of Paul, the theater was expanded to sit about 25,000 people. So if you visit Ephesus today, you can see a theater that is still largely well preserved and sit about 25,000 people. So you can imagine during the time of Paul, you can sit 20,000 people. And what people did in those days was you build theater, you build a theater that can accommodate 10% of the population. So if you have a theater that can sit 20,000, you have a population base of 200,000 uh, population. That's quite, that's large by Asian standard. So let's take a look at Ephesus. This is one of the main street. That the, this, this is the library. So those of you who have been to Ephesus, this will be familiar to you. And then on one hand here, uh, there is a very beautiful temple, and one hand there is a cluster of very beautiful houses. So across here, there is the ruins of what used to be the Nymphaean Shrine. It's called a fountain building. And this fountain was uh, donated by Tiberius Claudius uh, Aristian and his wife uh, at the turn of the second century. And they built this fountain in honor of Artemis and the Emperor. Uh, Trajan. And you can imagine this fountain was built by a, a, a couple, a husband and wife, at the turn of the 2nd century, at the early 2nd uh, century, the year 102 to 114. Now you can imagine a husband and wife can build this beautiful fountain, and what we see are just the wind, and donate it to the city as. Uh, in honor of Artemis and the Emperor. So this is how it looked like. So can you imagine a couple can uh, donate a building such as this? That give, really gives us a glimpse of the wealth of the city. This city is really, really very rich. And not only that, there are presently a number of excavations that has been carried out opposite the fountain that you see just now, just across the road, that is on the hill slope there is a cluster, there are clusters, cluster of houses there, and this cluster of homes are now being excavated. They are all different colors. Like this is one house, this is one house, one house, one house. They are all being, uh, they are being excavated, and this, for the sake of convenience, we just call them the archaeologists call them the terrace uh, house that are being excavated because the houses are all joined to one another. They are like big property. They are all joined together, and when and as you walk inside these houses, you realize that the people there are actually very, very rich. Let me give you a glimpse of some of the houses inside there. One of the indications of the social status of the people back then is this, the mosaic flooring. So when you look at the mosaic flooring, the more elaborate the design and the mosaic that's being used, if they are smaller in pieces, that tells you that these very very rich people because they're expensive. If the tile is big, and you wanna be la, you belong 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 as rich yet, but you try to be rich. But if you use a very delicate small towel, mosaic towel to do a design, it tells us that you are very very rich. And these mosaic are all made of very small towel. That means they are very rich. And not only they have uh, beautiful mosaic flooring. You also have beautiful painting, and these are just what you see a fresco on the wall. And these are the, you might want to say, the in thing for the, for the rich people back then, the kind of taste that they have. Uh, that is, you have beautiful mosaic flooring, you have painting, fresco that you paint on the wall. You don't even apply paint, you apply painting, you know, fresco drawings on the wall, and you will always engage the most famous artists to do that kind of work for you. So these are some of the uh, ruins that we see uh, today. So that gives us a glimpse to the wealth 
of the city. This city is really, really rich. It's not only rich, it's also a very learned city because here you have, this is the facade of what was used to be known as the library. So it's a learned city. It's not only wealthy, but a learned city because you have the library. Now, this library is just not any library that you see. It is what we would call a deposit library today. A deposit library simply means that every book that you publish, you must put a copy in the library. Let's say if you're an author here in Malaysia, you publish a book in Malaysia, you have to deposit, if I'm not wrong, come back home and make three or six copies with our national library, our Perpustakaan Negara. We have to, by law, we have to give it to them so that the library will keep every book that is published here. Let's say, for example, you go to the US, the Library of Congress will be a deposit library. If you go to the UK, for example, uh, uh, the British Library will be a deposit library. Cambridge University, Oxford University, they are also deposit libraries. So they, every book that's published in the UK, they, they have a copy there. Right, so this is what you call the deposit library. And so Ephesus is one of the three deposits library, which means they will have a lot of scribes. In those days, no, no printing press, right? So everything that was published, they have to hand copy. So they will hand copy every work that has been published. Say, for example, someone writes something, or you are, uh, Josephus writes something, or Plato writes something, or Aristotle has something, you make sure you have a copy of that work in this library. And they'll probably kept it either in scroll or in a book form or in the codex form. It's all written on papyrus, they'll stitch together to become a book like codex. They keep it in this library. So it's a very learned community. And next to the library, you have this arch, and you walk through this arch behind here is where you see the agora, the marketplace. Again, it is a commercial center. So you can see this is a commercial center, a learned center. You know, it's a port city and it's very wealthy. And you look at the road. This is coming from the port. Marble pavement, beautiful marble pavement that is still preserved for us until today. And oftentimes, if you go to Ephesus, the tour guide will point you that somewhere along this marble pavement, this is from the seaport that you walk towards the city center, you will see fruit print such as this. And it was interpreted uh, according to the tour guides. Uh, sometimes you don't know whether the tour guides say correctly or not. It was interpreted to say that these are the footprints of some of the ladies in town telling those men coming from the food seaport, follow this footstep and you shall find me and I shall give you pleasure. Something like that. <laughs> so in other words, it's also a place where sexual immorality thrives. In every ancient city, every port city, you see that. Right? So here you see the Agora. Now you see there's a state that is library, right? These are the shops surrounding the Agora. This is a huge place. You can take a look at it again. So all the ladies, if you live in the first century, this is the place you want to go. You want to go shopping here. And there was a story that says that how true we don't know. Like sometimes this kind of story legend continue on. It, 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 because this agora was situated just next to the library, apparently there's a story that goes this way. The men who bring their wife to the city center will tell their wife, wife, please go shopping, take my credit card if you want to, just go and enjoy yourself uh, in, in these shops here. While I go and read and update myself on what is the latest knowledge uh, in the world, in the latest news. So the men who walk into the library, the ladies will go, uh, the shopping and lo and behold when the men walk in the library when they go downstairs there's a secret passageway that leads them underneath the street that go across the road and they will end up to see another woman there <laughs> after the men finish what they need to finish they walk back to the library and they walk up from the library there they meet their wife hello darling how was your day how's your shopping <laughs> how true i don't know and then in the center of the town, there is the toilets. Even the toilets was actually quite beautifully designed. Uh, of course, those days, uh, there's no such thing called privacy in the toilet. Right? Everything is so open. And that is where uh, you want to find out the latest gossip in town. That is the place that you go to. And 
you actually sit quite close to one another. Just imagine that. <laughs> so we know a learned center, center for education, is a center for commercial business, right? It's a port city. People are very wealthy. And not only that, it's also a religious center. So you want to think about what is the best city in the world Ephesus has in all. You know? So you have, this is a religious center because you have the temple of Artemis. Now Artemis, this statue here, show us what Artemis is like. And what you see today, uh, the, 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 the temple has been destroyed because of earthquake. And now the foundation, you see the water here? The foundation of the temple is now being submerged here. So what you see now was this hole here, this column here that was actually reconstructed. If I can show you another view. So this is a reconstructed uh, column of what the temple of Artemis would have looked like. Now, this is known as one of the seven wonders in the ancient world, the temple of Artemis. Now, this is the big, biggest temple of Artemis. When we go to Sardis later on, I will show you the photo of the ruins of the Temple of Artemis in Sardis. Right? And you can imagine if the Temple of Artemis in Sardis is so huge, the one that is in Ephesus could have been bigger. Right? So Artemis is, this temple is one of the seven wonders in the ancient world. Artemis is celebrated, uh, she's being worshipped. And this goddess is so popular that it actually attracts pilgrims from all over the world. This means that people would travel from every corner of the world to Ephesus in order to worship Artemis, sometimes known as the god of fertility. So if you want to have a baby and you cannot have a baby, Go and see Artemis. She will solve your problem. So if you want to, fertility doesn't even doesn't mean having babies only. It could also mean your livestock. Go and see Artemis. As long as something that can multiply your wealth, go and see Artemis. Artemis will do wonders for you. Now I want you to imagine this is a place Paul made his home in. To, during his third mission journey for two years plus. How are you going to preach the gospel in a city such as this? But to give us a glimpse of how powerful Artemis is, if you read the narrative in Acts chapter 19, you see that when Paul preached the gospel to the people, many people actually believed and there's one trader blacksmith by the name of Demetrius, according to Acts. He found that his business dropped. And then when his business dropped, he gathered a group of people and he organized a riot against Paul. Because he said that, hey, are we going to tolerate Paul around here? Because look at our business. Our business has dropped. Nobody is buying from us because all these people got converted by Paul. So what would people like Demetrius and all these people were selling? They would sell figurines or terracotta figures uh, to worshippers who come from all over the world and then they can buy something back to remember like a souvenir or a little altar that they could worship. Now it's no different you go to temples today, you go to Penang today, right? Outside the temple you see all the traders selling things that help you to worship. You go to the Ark of John Temple, you go to Galaxy, uh, you can uh, I don't know about now, I've not been to Galaxy. Those days that when you walk up the path uh, along the roads that on the left and the right, all people selling clothes, souvenirs and everywhere. And, and can you imagine if in that one day the church is grew so powerful and more and more people become Christians and suddenly you find all the traders around Galaxy are making noise. Yeah, we don't have business anymore. All the people uh, have now been converted to become Christians. Maybe. So how a riot take place? to protect the temple. And this is exactly what happened in Ephesus. The Mitras gang up the people against Paul. And what did they do? These are some of the things that they could have sold. And this terracotta figure of Artemis, of Ephesus, 
was actually discovered. And this show that these are probably one of the things that the traders made and they sell it to the people who had come uh, to worship uh, Artemis. Let me tell you one interesting story. Um, this, this happened to me. I, I, I made a trip to Ephesus and I was leaving Ephesus. I bought, I bought this statue of Artemis. Now, I bought this statue of Artemis because I use it as an object of teaching. So it is now displayed in our uh, SDM library. Because in SDM, we have a collection of uh, archaeological replica that inform and help us understand the Jewish and the greco roman world. And so we have some collection there. So we use that as object to teach our students to understand the religious settings of the background. So I bought this uh, statue from the museum. And, and it's a bit fragile, so I can't carry it. So I was checking it at the airport. I was actually detained after the security scanning. <laughs> after you go through the x-ray, right? And they, they, they pull me aside straight away and they detain. Sir, we have to scan your bag again. There's something suspicious in this bag. So can we open up your bag? I said, yes, please. They open up. They took off all the items. They scanned through one by one. <laughs> so I was actually holding up the key already. <laughs> and after that, really, they said, okay, sir, this is the box that we are suspicious of. Can you please open this box? What is inside here? I said, uh, this is a statue of Archimedes I bought from the museum. No, we need you to open it up. And then I opened up, I showed them the statue of Artemis. They all, all those uh, security officers were all burst out in laughing. And then they let me go. Then I was like, what, did you, what were you suspicious of? They said, it looks like drugs on our x-ray machine. <laughs> so, so, don't simply buy Artemis. <laughs> That's a moral of the story. So, here you have all this. And then, this is a city that is thriving, as I said. Apart from that, uh, the library, these are the terrace houses. Dotted along this main street, there are various temples that you can see that are dedicated to various gods and shrines. So you see, commercial centre, right? A learning centre. A centre that generates wealth, right? A religious centre. Not only that, it's also an entertainment centre. And this is the famous Ephesus Theater. You want to test acoustic, this is a place that you can go and test acoustic. So this is a group of Americans that were there and this guy was reading from Acts, uh, from Acts the, the, the narrative of Paul's uh, mission journey to Ephesus. And this is the road, do you see this road? This is the road that were led to the ancient port back then over there. And unfortunately, one of the problems that Ephesus had was there is a lot of sediment. And so the, 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 the port, uh, one of the, that's the challenge for the port because of sand coming in sediment and then uh, the, 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 the port can never be the deep port, deep sea port for all the larger vessels to dock anymore. So that's why it lost its uh, popularity later on. So can you imagine this is a stadium? I was standing up there and this is actually two of my team uh, that were with me for the tour. Uh, they were singing down there, they were talking to me, and you can see this stadium can see 25,000 people. You don't need any EA system, you can just talk to one another without even raising your voice. If you stand at the right spot, you can hear each other clearly. Beautiful acoustic. Right? So here you can see this is the, the road to the top. That's the view of the stadium. And this is the road that we talk about. So just imagine. Ephesus. Imagine you are Paul, right? You are now bringing the gospel to this place. What do you think will be the challenges that you will face? This is a very learned community. If you will, it's probably equivalent to like a, probably a university town today where everyone Every other person has a PhD, something like that. Wealthy, deeply religious, deeply rooted in the life of the Greco Roman world back then, which means you enjoy pleasure, you enjoy entertainment, not to mention sexual immorality, a very hedonistic lifestyle. You can see it here. So, this is the place. 
So how are you going to proclaim the gospel and tell the people that Jesus is the one true God? Whereas Artemis is there, it is one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, one of the most powerful goddess that was recognized worldwide. How are we going to preach the gospel to the very learned community who will frown upon uh, a saviour that has been crucified by the Roman Empire and died on the cross? No Roman citizen would want to believe that because it's too shameful because a crucifixion of the cross is only reserved for the worst kind of criminal in those days. So how with your logical thinking and mind that God will do something so shameful for us? God is always powerful. God is always mighty. When you live in the Greco-Roman world, everything is about honor and shame. So how could God do something so shameful? How do you preach the gospel here then? But yet we know Paul had a successful ministry. A ministry that's so successful that even the people burn their scrolls, that even the people who practice whatever false teaching will give them up, and even the business the traders that were there in this place that carried out business because of the temple of Artemis also suffered a drop in their business. Let me ask you if you're a businessman. What percentage of your profit margin or revenue, what percentage of the drop of your revenue is sufficient for you to behave like Dimitris? Dimitris Mamboranta. <laughs> now, if you're a business Person, what drop in revenue is sufficient for you to carry out this sort of action? 20%? 30%? 40%? about that. So the people who have turned to Christ must have been large enough to cause a drop in the business. And don't forget, this is not a small town of 200 people. This is a metropolis has 200,000 population and their business is from all over the world. And Paul, empowered by the Spirit of God, preached the gospel here for two years plus, would have converted a lot of people that caused a drop in the business among the religious community in Jesus. So think about that. The far reaching impact of the gospel. And so Paul spent two years plus there, and it was mentioned that Paul taught in the Tyrannous Hall. And Paul must have taught the people well. And I strongly believe that the people know their scripture well, because you, are, you, you come to faith in a rather hostile community. You just imagine that, right? I become a Christian in a place where you pay honor to Artemis, one of the seven wonders in the ancient world. That means this is a very religious place. So if I become a Christian, you can imagine that if I'm involved in business, every of my business partner will be somehow connected either with the pot or with Artemis or one of the religious cults. So you can imagine it's hard for me to survive. It's hard for me to maintain my faith. When I'm confronted with people worshipping all kinds of cows. It's hard for me to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified because the community that I live in is a learned community who shun anything that is shameful. And all the more, if you belong to the wealthy community, that means your network will always be with the people in the views or association or the temple. Remember yesterday I talked about temple. It's not only a religious place, but it's a place for social network. So if I'm a wealthy individual in Ephesus and I become a Christian, I have a lot to lose. Unless I'm deeply rooted in my faith and I know what I believe. So here is a place where Paul must have nurtured the Christians there. He could have been in Ephesus during his third mission journey. That means that would be probably in the 50s, in the mid-50s. Now if Revelation were written in the 80s or 90s, it would mean 30 to 40 years for the past, really. Like 30 over years have passed. It means you're talking about second generation Christians, really, right? And this second generation Christian inherited the faith from their parents. And 
in Revelation chapter 2, it says that this is the church that has patient endurance. That means if they are being persecuted, they know how to stand strong and they cannot bear with anything evil. And they, they, they tested those, those who are called their apostles. Anyone that comes and says, oh no, Jesus has not been crucified, he is not died, he is not raised from the dead, you will reject them straight away. You know the teaching of the truth very well. And yet, interestingly, this is a church that is well-fed, well-taught, that grew up in a rather hostile environment, right? The founding story was very hostile. Uh, Paul, they, 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 they had a riot in the stadium, in the stadium that you see just now. That's a place it was believed that they had this riot in the stadium, according to Acts, where they shouted, Great is Artemis! Great is Artemis! How can it be that this is a church that is so deeply rooted in the teaching of the truth of the gospel could have forsaken their first love. And that is the rebuke for this church. How can a church which did not tolerate evil doers and they're able to expose false teachers, false apostles, false apostles, and yet they could forsake their first love. Now when we talk about first love, you notice that in Revelation chapter 2, in this letter, it was not mentioned whom the first love was directed to. When you say you have forsaken your first love, your first love to whom? It was never mentioned, right? Is it your first love to God? Or is it your first love towards the people? Or could it be both? Think about that. First love towards whom? Have they forgotten their first love to God? Or have they forsaken their first love to others as well? Let me paint a picture. Sometimes, as Christians, we can be so zealous for the truth that we can be very, very judgmental towards other people. And we are not very gracious to people. Sometimes Christian leaders go to war with, with one another. Why? Because we cannot agree on the most minute details. And we fight, we label one another, we use condescending terms against one another. Could it be that the church in Ephesus, in their quest for truth, for the purity of the doctrine, they could have treated their brothers and sisters badly if they had doubt? Because if I can't tolerate the false teachers, can you imagine one of you come to me and say, I, I, I don't know about this, I doubt about this, I question my faith. You have no place in this church anymore because we are the defender of the truth. So could it be that people have doubt when they come to you, they will be brushed aside, they will be labeled, their faith is not genuine. Could it be in our quest for doctrinal purity, when we see someone fall into temptation or into sin, we have no longer have grace for them. We judge them immediately. We behave worse like the Pharisees. They've forgotten that sometimes when we come to the church, this is the hospital for sinners. This is the place where sinners find forgiveness. That's why when we have the Holy Communion, we come forward and we kneel down. We recognize that it is only by the grace of God we come. And the Holy Communion Eucharist is a reminder that this is the means of grace. Have we forgotten that? So I wonder whether the church in Ephesus, in their quest for doctrinal purity, in defending the truth so much, they have hurt a lot of people along the way. They may have lost their first love towards their fellow brothers and sisters, or maybe even towards the people who are outside the church. After all, they're going to hell, why we bother? We don't love them anymore. We judge them. Why are you worshipping idol? You go to hell. We, we 
don't love them anymore. And couldn't be they have forsaken their love for God. So sometimes in our quest of doctrinal purity, it can misplace our love for God as well. We can know so much, but yet we are the least lovable people on earth. The love of God, the love of knowledge should go hand in hand. Just as we are deeply equipped with our faith in our faith in God, it should overflow our love for one another. And unfortunately, the church in Ephesus has forsaken that. But we thank God that just as Christ rebuilt the church, the church continued to survive. In fact, during the uh, uh, during the fifth century, in the four hundred thirty-five, I'm not wrong, uh, Ephesus holds the third ecumenical council uh, in the church of Saint Mary, and you can still see the ruins of this church. So this is a church where. In, in, in the early 5th century, about 250 bishops gathered together and they deliberate on a number of issues. Okay. Now, so this is Ephesus. So when we think about Ephesus, we think about ourselves. So are we also in danger of forsaking our first love towards God and humanity? This is, we want to know God more. We want to equip ourselves in the knowledge of the truth and of His Word. But in that process, have we also forsaken our love for God and one another? And in what ways have we forsaken our first love? So this is a lesson for the Ephesus church that could help us think about our own journey of faith. Just as God has rebuilt this church for being a very solidly biblical church and yet forsaken their love, first love. And I would suggest it's their first love for God they are also first love for people around them. Have we also been guilty of this as well? Okay, it's 10 of 10 o'clock. Can we take five minutes to stretch yourself? I know we have coffee break at 10.45. So that reserve at 1.45. Just stretch yourself if you really cannot hand in the good appointment, do so. We'll come back in five minutes and you'll go to the second church and then we'll break for our longer coffee break. Right? Just stretch yourself. And for 10 days you will have tribulation. Be faithful unto death, and I'll give you the crown of life. He who has ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Simna or Facebook today is one of the largest cities in uh, Turkey. Unfortunately, if you were to visit the city, there's nothing really much to remind us of the ancient city of Sena. That is a small, there is an agora that's been excavated that we can visit, but that's about all. Uh, it's a very modern city, and the city, it's a city by the coast, and this is a place that when you walk in the city, you wonder whether you are actually in Turkey or not, because uh, this, this is a typical this is the street that fronts the coastal area. You just imagine Bernie Drive in Penang. Uh, before, before the, right, before the uh, reclamation that's going on now, you see one of those road, you can see all the Porsche restaurants, all the hotels, all the makam places. Uh, no different here. Uh, in the evening, you see everyone gathering here. And these are all parks, by the way. Everyone drinking freely away. And, and this is supposedly to be a Muslim country, right? Uh, and so this is certain. But interestingly, this church, as I mentioned earlier on, is one of the two churches that has no condemnation. There's not, if you read this, it's all full of praises. It is exhortation for them. There's no condemnation. You have forsaken your first love. No, you don't see that kind of rebuke uh, in Sanna. And Sanna, in, during the time of John, in, or in the first century, is a center of imperial worship. And as a center of imperial worship, it simply means that this is the place that everyone will pledge their allegiance to Caesar. I talked about imperial worship quite at length yesterday already. And so you have Christians as a minority in a city such as this. There were intense persecution, and many of the believers have gone through difficult times and 
hardship. But this is a, yet this is a church that persevere in the midst of trials, in the midst of uh, tribulations. And they have persecution coming from all sides, not only from the Roman authority. They also have persecution coming from the Jews who claim that they were from the synagogues. So you have, you have persecution both from the Gentiles, from the, from the imperial authorities, you have persecution from the Jewish people as well. So if you're a Gentile here, you got attacked from both sides. And yet this is a place, this is a church where Christ gave his highest commendation. You, I know your tribulation. I know you're, you're poor. Right? Uh, your poverty could be because you're poor or because you are minority, you become Christian, you'll be truthful to the faith, you lost your revenue in your business. It could be any of these reasons. And Christ told them that they should not fear about being tortured or suffered or being persecuted. Don't even worry. The devil is going to throw some of you into prison so that you will be tested and there will be 10 days. Now, when you talk about numbers in Revelation, I'll be a bit more cautious. The 10 days are probably not literal 10 days. It just tells you there's a period of time. Now, what is 10 days compared to one month, two months? It may not be that long. Yes, you'll be, ten, you'll be tested not for a day, for 10 days, which means that it is not a very short time, but it's not a very long time either. But know that whatever you are persecuted, that tested is for a period of time. It's not that long, but be faithful. Then some of you may even face that. Be faithful even to the point of death. And then I will give you the crown of life. Now this crown of life uh, is a reflection of the historical setting of the city of Serna. Serna is famous for their games. So when you compete in the athlete games, what you always aim or hope for is to win the crown. Now, in the New Testament, there are two words that are being used specifically to describe crown. And oftentimes, in our English translation, both of these two Greek words we translate as crown as well. And actually, there are two Greek words. One is called Stephanos. Uh, so anyone named Stephen here? That's your name, the crown, <laughs> Stephanos. Stephanos means the crown you receive as a reward after we, you win the game. You run in athletic games, you run the, uh, the race, you receive the crown. That is a Stephanos. So this crown of life is a Stephanos. There is another crown that is only given to those in authority, in positions of power, or to kings. This is described as the diadem. Uh, we translate as diadem. Diadema. Right? So Christ in Revelation when he received the crown is not the same word in the Greek word. Even the English we translate the same. So sometimes I will, I will prefer to translate as crown, like as a reward you receive. Diadem as the one that only gives, that was given according to you because you deserve it, because you are a king. You are royalty. Right, so that is diadem. And so this is the crown. Now the crown that people go for, if you run in the Olympic Games or any Olympic Games, is actually not even a medal made of gold, whatsoever it is. It's made of perishable reef. So what you do is, you cut off from the olive leaves, from the olive branches, and you just put them together and they become a reef. If you if you follow me on the on the tour to, to Greece of the if I can find an olive tree, I will make a reef from you. Just like one of the trips I went to Greece, uh, uh, I get the group to run the race in the Olympic Stadium, so I make a reef for them. So this is the reef, that's how it looks like. <laughs> so you just cut off from the olive uh, uh, branches and you just twirl around it, you know? Uh, you just put it together and and it looks like this. This will be a reef. Right? So this is the crown that every athlete, when they run, this is something that they look forward to receive. It's like the reward. So that's why Christ said in this letter, you receive the crown of life uh, if you are being martyred for your faith. Uh, so it's the Stephanos, it's the crown. And so how you look like when you wear on it, uh, it looks something like this. So 
I did a demo. We run in the Olympic Stadium uh, in Olympus, and the one who win uh, the race uh, give them this crown. And we, by the end of our journey, uh, about a week later, we start to <laughs> win her off already. It won't last long. Right? So that's, just, that's what Paul says is that when runners they run, right? What did they go for? They go for a perishable leaf. But for us, no. We look for the imperishable crown that Christ is going to give us. And so that is the Stephanos. So to people who in Sermon, they can identify with this because it's a center for games. People are running. So everyone wants that crown. But Christ says, I will give you that crown of life. It's few and severe, even to the point of death. But it was quite interesting that in the city of Sermon, is the place where many martyrs died for their faith. This is the place where it's the center of imperial worship. This is the place where, as a Christian minority, you are being tested for your faith. So as you are being tested for your faith, there is always this option before us. Will we renounce or will we recant our faith? But sometimes when nothing happens to us, it's easy for us to say, stay firm, stand strong. When the knife was being pointed at us, what would we do? I remember when the missionaries first came to Japanese, to, Jap- to the Japan, evangelizing the Japanese at the time. These are mainly the Catholic Jesuits that first came to Japan as they evangelized the Japanese people. And even until today, we know that Japan is such a hard ground. The number of population is so small despite the so many years of Christianity in the country. And you know that when, when they want to persecute the Japanese Christian, they want to identify who Christians are, they have a way of so, see for example, if I come to you, any one of you here who is a Christian, I, I'm going to throw you into prison. We may not want to step forward. Right? You'll be sometimes foolish for us to step forward. You say, keep quiet. But what we will do is, how am I going to know that you are a Christian? Simple. They put a block of wood and they put a cross on top of it. They ask all of you to line up, spit on this, stand on it, kick it, and I know you're not a Christian. So if you and I were there, what would you do? So that's how they differentiate. They know that if there's a Christian that's loyal to Christ, they will not do that. But if they will not do that, they know that you are a Christian. And if you want to see some of this wooden block that they use uh, to test whether the Japanese back then is a Christian or not, you don't have to go far to see it. Just make a trip down south to Singapore and go to the Asian Civilization Museum. There's one section that they have this on display and you can see how Christians who refuse to spit on the cross, to step on it, paid for the price of their faith. So in the city of Sermon, it's no different. As Christians, sometimes we are also confronted with this harsh reality. Will we be able to remain faithful to the end? Be faithful until death has but Revelation say in chapter 2, verse 10. In the 2nd century, there is a famous saint who lived in the city of Sarna. He died as a martyr. And his name is Paulika, one in the early church. Polycarp was a person 
who was deeply, deeply committed to God. And as the Roman Empire charged him, they asked him to offer incense to Caesar. That's all. So what how? You can still worship Jesus, go and do what you like. But I want you to offer incense to Caesar and just to say Caesar is Lord, that's it. And your life will be spared. And of course, Polycarp refused. He's such a gentle old man and everyone has high respect for him. There was even documented that the soldiers from the Imperial Army came to him and begged him, Polycarp, can you just please offer incense that we can let you go? We do not want to arrest you, but Polycarp refused. So the charge that was issued to him was, Polycarp refused to offer incense to the Roman emperor and say, Caesar is Lord. So if you refuse to do that, what is your punishment? Polycarp, of course, was arrested and he was burned alive. And even before they set fire on him, they asked Polycarp one more time, Polycarp, would you recant your faith? Just say Caesar is Lord. Polycarp refused. And he replied with these very famous words that many of us hold dear today. At that point in time, he was 86 years old. An old man burned him alive. And Polycarp says this, 80 and 6 years have I served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and savior? Eighty and six years, I serve my Lord. And all of these eighty-six years, my Lord has done me no wrong. How can I ever even say Caesar is Lord and burn and send to him and blaspheme against my king and savior? Because all he had stood to stand and as a result, he was burned alive. And the words in Revelation spoken just a few decades earlier rings true. Be faithful to the point of that. So this is Samna, a church where the faith of the people is, is constantly being tested. It's a, it's a church that is being persecuted because of their faithfulness to God. It's a church that refused to bow down to Caesar. Is a church who choose to worship God. That's why I remember yesterday I said, when you read Revelation, when you, when you encounter with the living God, you, you can only do one thing, bow down and worship Him. If we bow down and worship Him, we can worship no other. And Polycarp discovered that. Eighty and six years have I served Him. He worship God and serve Him and Him again. So He can serve no other gods. And He paid for His thing. Today when we visit Samna, we often drop by. The, uh, there's a church that was built to commemorate uh, Polycarp at the entrance of the church. So it says St. Polycarp. This is the church inside there. It's a, uh, it's a Catholic church that reminds us of Polycarp's faith, his life, and his inspiration. Of course, there's a beautiful altar. What is interesting in this church is the ceiling. You look at the ceiling, it's full of fresco and a painting on the ceiling and the side panel. And all the paintings on the ceiling tell us the story of Polycarp and his life. How this gentle old man was so faithful and dedicated to Jesus. And in the center of it all, it shows Polycarp being martyred and seated with Christ, uh, in that sense, being welcome and is given the crown life. And this is another painting that showed him, uh, was, he was being asked one more time, will you recant? Will you burn incense to Caesar? Would you say Caesar is Lord? Polycarp said, no, 80 and 6 years I buy serve him, and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme against my God and Savior? He was burned. Alive. And this is one example of a faithful follower of Jesus who paid the price because he lived in a city that worshipped Caesar. Caesar in Lord and that's no longer. 
And it's difficult because it is in this city that if you do not worship Caesar and you proclaim that it's another Lord, it is considered as an act of might. It's an act of treason. And the act of treason sometimes deserves death penalty. I often wonder whether for us today we reflect on the message of Revelation. How would the church in Sunna be relevant for us? How would the life of Polycarp be relevant for us? Eighty and six years have I served him and has done me no wrong. How can I bless me? I king and savior. If you look around us today, in many parts of the world, people suffered for their faith. People were persecuted for their faith. And the words of God to the church of Serna serve as inspiration. And if you, now you know why this is a church that is full of commendation because they remain true to Jesus. They refuse to bow down to Caesar, refuse to offer sins to Caesar. And that's why this is one church that has no rebuke. It's a church that is faithful to the end. It's a church that hang on uh, to their faith and be faithful even until the point of that. Yes, trial and tribulation they come for a period of 10 days. It's not short, but it's not too long. But they persevere and God shall deliver them. And God says to the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. So I often wonder when one day we never know, when we are confronted with a final choice, who will you worship? Who is this Caesar? He may not be the Roman Empire anymore, but who, who is this Caesar in our world today that often tempt us to worship this God? Who is this Caesar in our community, in our life, in our faith, that once draws away from God? Will we bow down to Caesar? Or will we only worship God? Will we say, no matter how old we are today, whatever years, if you're 50, you're 60, you're 61, 60 and 1 years, if I serve him, he has done me no wrong. How can I bless him, my king and my savior? So how can calling up faith be an inspiration for us? Even in the time of persecution, will we remain faithful? And if we live in the time where the Japanese persecuted Christians at that point in time, when we are asked, either you spit on this, step on this, and go free, or you will be tortured for your faith. Which one will we choose? Now, if you look at throughout the history of the church, none of us is spared, and we never know when it will happen. I often remind myself, it's easy for me to say because I actually never suffered for my faith. Even if anything is just some inconveniences in life. I've never gone through what Polycarp has gone through. I've never gone through what the Japanese Christians have gone through during that time. In that case, I also remind myself, my faith has not been truly, truly, truly tested until a point where I need to say, will I give it up or not? Yes, I may suffer. I may have to let go when I was involved in property development in real estate. I may have let go of certain deals because I felt that it wasn't right for me as a Christian to do. I may suffer only here and there, but these are just inconveniences. But not to the point where I had to say Caesar is Lord, burn incense to Caesar or to God alone. I don't come to that stage. So I also wonder, if I ever come to that stage, right, would I speak and stand, step on the cross? Or would I be back to face? consequences. I think that's a question that all of us need to ask ourselves. Yes, we can pray that God spare us from this, but we will never know. And are we prepared? It's like what the words of God says here. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, 
and for ten days he had tribulation and be faithful until death and I will give you the crown of life. And sometimes we think of it as quite sobering. God actually never promised us that he would deliver us from death at times. He tells us to be faithful until death and Polycarp paid for the price. Many martyrs of the church paid for the price. No wonder there's this famous saying, the blood of the martyrs are the seed of the church. And we can be where we are today because someone paid the price for us. And that is another challenge for us. More so when we live quite comfortably. Uh, where I would say that as Malaysian Christians, we are quite comfortable. Or we, we don't have that kind of severe persecution. Yes, some places we cannot build churches like this. Uh, some churches have to live in shop house. Yes, that is something conveniences in life. But it's not to the point where we are truly, truly being tested for our faith. What will we say when we are tested out of the way? That is the message to sir. Okay, um, okay, we have five more minutes to coffee. We'll just stop for coffee break. Then after that, I'll just continue on to find other churches. I can move on a bit faster already. And we'll look at the government after we come back at 11. Okay, since we are five minutes early, can we come back five minutes earlier? We come back at 11.10. <laughs> we have half an hour. Right, let's come back at 11.10 and I'll continue with the third church and I'll wrap up the seven churches before we go for lunch.